Um, we've been in a study about the Holy Spirit since June, believe it or not. Um, if you had told me back then that we'd still be in it two weeks into almost October, I would have been like, whoa, what happened? Did, did, did I take a break? Did I <laughs> something? It feels like that magician's thing where you pull the handkerchief and it just keeps on coming. Um, and it started out with just this initial question, this thought that I had that, why don't we talk about the Holy Spirit? Like, yeah, we would come across verses and he would be mentioned. It's not like we'd hop over it. But why don't we talk about him? And I thought, okay, so let's, let's just have a study. Let's dive into who the Holy Spirit is, what he did in the Old Testament, and what he did in the New Testament. And then that would lead us into this question that became really, really important and really, really um, I would say faith changing on a lot of levels for me personally. And that is, what is the Holy Spirit doing in my life today? What is the Holy Spirit doing in our lives today? Galatians 5 says we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. What does that mean? What does that mean? And why do so many Christians have trouble answering that clearly and confidently? So we've been asking those questions, and that's led us to be in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And I think to truly understand what it means to be led by the Spirit, we need to understand what these fruit of the Spirit are, what they look like, these traits, these characteristics. And um, I didn't start with love, and I know that kind of rattled some cages. Um, that is an elephant in the room. I will, again, address that. <laughs> Paul started with it because it's the most important. I'm going to finish with it because it's the most important. We're on the same page. We're, we're not, we're not going to have to argue about that. It is the most important one. We're going to send off this series with it. It is the most important one. I started with self-control. Because in my mind, boy, if we could have some better self-control, we could really start to embody more of these characteristics in a much more powerful way. From there, it felt like, hmm, peace. God's putting it on my heart that I need to be talking about sharing and bringing peace because this world is really searching for that in a really powerful way. Um, and in my own personal life, having an experience at Chalk Hospital really made that apparent that that's what... <laughs> needed to um, come from me from the pulpit that week. Well, the next fruit that I wanted to look at, it really goes hand in hand with peace. It just kind of, I just had to do it because you don't hear peace and goodness. You don't hear peace and kindness. You hear this, peace and joy. This was a simple Google search Christmas cards. Peace and joy, peace and joy, peace and joy, peace and joy, peace and joy. Someone didn't get the memo and someone put joy and peace. <laughs> um, obviously, they, they don't know what they're doing. Um, but it goes together, and this whole service, this whole theme for today has been all about joy. Um, most languages have a lot of words to describe joy, right? Happy, cheerful, joyful, so on. Um, the same is true for the languages of the Bible. In ancient Hebrew, there's a variety of words, and in Greek and the New Testament, there's another variety of words. And you know what? I'm just not going to butcher them this week. I know you guys look forward to me getting up here and pretending like I can do that. We're going to skip that this week because there's also a lot of them. Um, but what's interesting is each of these words has its own nuance, but they're all basically referring to that feeling of joy and happiness. But what makes these biblical joy words interesting is noticing what kind of things brings about the joy. And seeing how joy is also a key theme throughout the entire Bible narrative. Page one. God says the world is good. Then later he says it's very good. God found joy in it. Guess what we also do a lot of the time? We also find joy in the natural beauty of the world. What happens when people get on honeymoons? They want to, or get married? They, I ruined it. What happens when people do when they get married? They want to go on a honeymoon and go experience God's joy as a way to kick off their marriage. Yeah, sure. That checks out. When people say, I need a break, I need to get away, they're not talking about locking themselves up in a warehouse with no windows. No, they want to escape to what? A beach somewhere in God's creation right? It's almost as if it's encoded in us that we're able to find this joy in what God's created. I mean, people even find joy in the desert. If you don't believe me, 
Death Valley National Park gets 1.1 million visitors every year. That is, that is shocking to me. I've never been there, and I don't plan on it. It's just, that is not for me. But God describes the world as good, as beautiful, as something for us to enjoy. In fact, the first words ever recorded a person saying, Adam saying in the Bible, is kind of a rejoicing praise. Bones of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Yes, I got a woman. I will name her woman because she came for me. Listen, if you're going to put your name on something, it's because you're proud of it. You're happy about it. That's the first thing ever recorded a human saying in the Bible. It's joy. Joy is a running theme. In fact, we'll go, let's just get this one out of the way. Psalm 104, the psalmist says a good bottle of wine is God's gift to bring joy to people in their heart. Okay. People find joy in their children, in their wedding, in their lives. However, we know, we know throughout human history and even in our own lives, life isn't just one big joy fest. In fact, the complete opposite is true, right? The biblical story even shows how we live in a world that's been corrupted by our own selfishness. It's marked by death and loss and pain and suffering. Even the first sin, in some ways, can be told through the lens of God's not giving you joy. You're being robbed of joy. He said you can't what? You can't enjoy that fruit over there? Really? Oh, boy. Let me tell you, there's joy to be had outside of God. And, and Adam and Eve go, really? And we've been believing that lie ever since. Humans have been believing that lie ever since. But the biblical story also goes on to show how we live with a new, complete joy in this world that's marked with death and loss and pain and suffering. We're going to see joy as an attitude of God's people, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promises. When the Israelites were suffering from slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead them into freedom. And the first thing they did once they, once they get into, cross the Red Sea, they praise God. They rejoice. You have led with loving kindness the people you have made free. You have led them in your strength to your holy place. They're still in a desert. They have, the promised land is not really in sight. They're still pretty vulnerable. But it's in this joy, in this wilderness moment, that it becomes a defining kind of characteristic of God's people. A way of saying the joy of God's people is not determined by their needs or by their struggles, but by their future. Later in Israel, when they're suffering under the impression of foreign empires, the prophet Isaiah looks forward to a day when God would raise up a new deliverer like Moses. That's when those redeemed by the Lord will return to Zion with glad shouts, with eternal joy crowning their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them. And while the Israelites waited, they chose joy to anticipate their future redemption. And that future redemption starts to happen, and the world even got an announcement about it from heaven. How cool is that? Luke 2.10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring good news that will cause joy. <laughs> Great joy for all the people. We're told Jesus himself was full of joy and gave thanks to the Father when he began to announce the kingdom of God. He taught his followers about the same joy in the wilderness when he said, when people reject you, when they persecute you for following, you, for following me, what are you supposed to do? Rejoice. Be glad. Find joy in that. Because that's what they do to me. Well, why? What's our reward in that? The future. Heaven. And after his death, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and announce the good news to all the world. That he was the risen king. The hope of all. And they did so. These early Christian communities were so known for being full of joy even when they were being persecuted, that there's records of Christians walking into the Colosseum knowing what awaited them. 
starving lions ready to eat them alive. And you know what they did walking into that Colosseum? They sang songs of praise. And you know who they were modeling? Jesus. Because it was the cross that was the joy set before him. You know, Tamara and I celebrated our 15th uh, 15th wedding anniversary. Um, We tried to, at least. Uh, Last weekend, we... (laughs) We, had, we made all the plans, we, we, went to, we booked a show to go, we, booked a, we got tickets to go see a band, and they got sick, <laughs> so they canceled. Then, our babysitting almost had to be canceled because our aunt, my aunt, who's so wonderful and loving, had to be evacuated from the fires. Praise God that she is okay and they are okay, but, whew. And by the way, this is the same week that our AC broke in our house. It was a week, a cascade of stuff that we didn't plan, and it's kind of like, I guess it is what it is. And it's during this time, I come across this verse, Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may stay for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Huh. I thought about this verse, and I thought, well, wait a second. This sounds more like a Folgers <laughs> jingle than a... The best part of waking up is joy in the morning? Does the teaching go like no matter how sad you are at night, you wake up in the morning with a smile on your face? I don't know about you guys, but I have a tendency to go to bed bummed about things and then wake up in the morning even more anxious and more worried and more stressed out about all the things. It's like, oh, look at that. The problems of yesterday followed me to today. And I've got a million more things to do now because they just are piling. Huh. So is the Bible wrong because the weeping in the night did not turn into rejoicing in the morning? By the way, I didn't cry. I was just upset. I wasn't crying into my pillow. I don't want you guys to get the wrong picture here. No. I got to begin to realize what this verse is actually saying is that a child of God will receive a joy of such intensity that no sorrow, no pain can overwhelm it. I'm thinking about this, and it's, it's getting late because I can't sleep because guess what? The AC went out, and it's too hot. But I start to wonder, you know what? We're going to be fine. We'll figure this out. Tamara and I will figure it out. We'll be fine. We actually spent most of Saturday here at the building. She was working on her Sisters in Spirit lesson, and I was working on my sermon, and we had a little breakfast, and we just kind of did powwow back and forth. I guarantee we will remember this anniversary, this random everything went wrong anniversary, more than any, oh, we planned a dinner and I brought you some flowers and we got dressed up. I guarantee that we will remember this one. We ended up doing a few fun things. We got to do a few fun things. One of the things was we got to watch that new Lord of the Rings series. How interesting that Jeff brings up Gandalf. It's like he <laughs> knew. Um, and it's been a while since I got nerding on you guys. But J.R.R. R. Tolkien, he's a Christian. And in his book, Lord of the Rings, there's a, there's a place where the where Gandalf, this great wizard, has all the world's problems on his shoulders. And I always feel really bad for Gandalf. All the characters have their problems in these stories, but a lot of times they go, but Gandalf will save us? Whoa, that's a lot. And he always is trying to. But in this one moment, in this one part of this this section of this um, novel, everything's going wrong. If you've watched the movies, if you've read the books, it is like, like if I have... Our 15th anniversary was everything going wrong. That's like not even two pages in Lord of the Rings. It is one thing after another going wrong, going wrong. You get a little bit of hope and then boom. And one of the characters makes this really dark, pessimistic statement. This, th- that kind of we're done for comment. And Gandalf begins to laugh. And he does this laugh that comes from this deep down parts of his heart and his belly. And he looks at his friends and his, the fellowship and he says, we'll be fine. That in spite of all this incredible pressure and strain on him and them, this weak, frail old man, underneath it all, there's this fountain of joy. No matter how big the problem was, no matter how many things were going wrong for him, joy was their rock. You can see how Tolkien was a follower of Christ. Because we need that in our lives. A joy of such intensity in a Christian life that nothing can put it out. 
We need to make sorrow a temporary condition for us. Enjoy the underlining permanent condition of our hearts and souls. So what do we need to do then to get into that state? How does that joy become such a defining characteristic of our faith? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get into John 16. Um, we'll spend a quite a bit of time here, actually. This is a really interesting passage. Jesus is saying to his disciples, listen, I'm about to leave you. I'm about to go and die, and you will see me no more. And you guys are going to be sad about that, especially you, Peter. He doesn't say that here in this part, but he, eventually he does tell him that. But I'm going to be back. And when I come back, you're going to have great joy. And they don't understand this. They don't understand what's going on at all. To be fair, I think we miss this sometimes today even. But it says they're asking all the questions. And what Jesus ends up doing here, he ends up talking not about peace or love. He ends up talking about joy. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Why don't we talk about this more? Is that, is that just a me thing right now? Why aren't we talking about this more? Like, how often should we bring this up to one another? Like, hey, you know, as a disciple of Christ, just as a matter of fact, no one can take away your joy. Let's just put a number on that. Every other week, is that, is that too much? Once a month, is that too little? Every week, should we bring this up every week? Every day? Like as a, as a perk, I'm just saying, sign me up. No one can take away my joy? Really? I don't know. Um, I've been touching around the edges of these fruits of the spirits um, on some level, but in reality, what they all are is they're all God's characteristics, right? Stay with me on this line of thinking. We are to imitate who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. Well, to do this, we need to have what? One of my go-to things. A relationship with God. A relationship with, the, with God that is so intimate that we catch his attributes, his qualities, his traits. We're going to catch this stuff. If you've got a really good relationship with your spouse, if you're really close with them, if they get a cold, guess what? You're probably getting it too. Let's just be honest. This is the way it goes. Unless you're my wife who somehow miraculously never gets the colds that my kids and I get. That's not me calling her out. She is loving and taking care of us. She is just somehow immune to the things that we get. However, on the flip side of that, when she does get sick, <laughs> you better believe I am coming down with a severe case of the man flu. And so is Noah. And so is Sawyer. Sawyer's going to have the worst case of the man flu. Penny's pretty solid. She's pretty tough. And what's really interesting is, you know, the longer you spend with your spouse over the years, you know what happens? You start to mirror each other. You do. You start to mirror each other. Your behaviors, even you start to look like each other, which, again, I really hope that's true because I married up. So what does that say, though, about God, about Jesus, and about the Holy Spirit? If you're spending time with God, what are you going to do? You're going to catch what God's got. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You're going to catch it. Then you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit, which guess what that's going to help you be? Led by the Spirit. And then guess what? Guess who you're going to start to look like finally and be imitating? Jesus Christ. And this joy is an attribute of God. It's another one of these things that I just like, are we talking about it enough? Right? We talk about God's love and amen for that. Amen for that, for God's love. We talk about his mercy and his faithfulness. Amen for that too. We say he is a good, good father. Yeah. How often do we talk about his joy? Sometimes I wonder if we think of him kind of like in the way that the world has thought about him or the world has painted these images of him with this long white beard, very stoic, very demure. 
where he's kind of leaning on the cloud with a finger down, and we're looking up, also with a finger pointing up, and we're doing this. This is weird. It's very stoic, very serious. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus is the only white guy in the Middle East with blue eyes and blondish hair. The only one there is... But you see these paintings a lot of times, and he's got this lamb, and he's very stoic, very serious. None of those paintings is Jesus going... filled with joy. It's getting better. I will say this. Thank you, the chosen, for that. But what I'm still waiting for people to see is that we're talking about joy as an attribute of God and Jesus too, which makes me want to say this. I think Jesus was fun. I think Jesus was fun. I'm, and you're probably like, Dave, how, what makes you say that? That is, that is kind of out there. Can you honestly imagine a somber, serious Jesus saying, bring me the children? Next. <laughs> Children don't go to people like that. They don't go to grumpy people. It's true. Nobody goes to go hang out at Old Man River's yard when he's yelling at them all the time. They don't. But the children went to Jesus. He was the type of guy that people wanted to be near. He smiled. He was the type of guy you wanted to invite to a party. David, how do you know that? Because they invited him to parties. In fact, Jesus got a plus 12. Because they invited his disciples. And mine says, don't bring your kids. Wait, Jesus got a plus how many? 12? What? They wanted him there so badly. They got a plus 12. But here's the thing. People might be saying, well, that's because he was Jesus. This is John 2. He's not doing miracles yet. He's not doing any of this stuff yet. What does that say about Jesus? When they were putting together this guest list, they were like, man, make sure Jesus' name is on the list. Man, he brings joy to the party. Why is this a big deal? I think it is. I think it's significant that common folk in a little town enjoyed being with Jesus. I think it's noteworthy that the Almighty didn't act high and mighty. That the Holy One wasn't holier than thou. That the one who actually knew it all wasn't a know-it-all. That upon his shoulders rested the challenge of redeeming creation, but he still took time to go to a wedding. And as a result, people liked him. They scoffed at his claims they accuse him of heresy, but it doesn't seem like they accuse him of being arrogant. He was branded as radical, but never unapproachable. He was accused of much, but never of being a grump or a self-centered jerk. No, people didn't groan when he didn't appear. They didn't go, oh, Jesus coming, comes another lecture. No. He called them by name. He listened to their stories. He answered, he answered their questions. He visited their sick relatives and helped their sick friends. He ate lunch with the little guy. He spoke resounding affirmation. He went to parties that he was criticized for hanging out with rowdy people, the questionable crowds. People were drawn to him. And he said, I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. Some of your translations might say, and have life to the fullness. What would be included in that? Joy. When the angels announced his arrival, it was good news of great joy. Jesus was filled with it. Are people going to say the same about us? Sitting in this room, are they going to say the same thing about us? When did we get the notion that a good Christian is a solemn one? Who started the rumor that a good disciple is the one that has a long face? <laughs> Puritans, Nikki. Our one English person would say that. You might not be wrong. I truly believe that Jesus was a fun, lovable, happy man because he was filled with joy. But it's not just Jesus here on his time on earth. This verse this week just stopped me in my tracks. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness, with his love. He will calm all your fears he will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Here's, I think this is what, your third or fourth? Hold up, stop. We've got to talk about this. I know the angels sing. I don't know that we sing. 
Are you guys reading that same thing that I'm reading? You guys see this? He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. God sings with us? When's the last time you heard that? That God has a joyful song to sing over you. Why aren't we talking about this? Where's this passage been all my life? Um, you know, J.R. Tolkien was actually really close friends with one of the other great fiction writers of the time, and that's, that's C.S. Lewis. And um, there's a really great story about C.S. Lewis's conversion to Christianity, um, a movie, um, The Most Reluctant Convert, I believe it's called. Um, and there's a conversation between the two of them, but, but a little later on, C.S. Lewis has this, this story. And it goes like this. He says, little ducks want to swim, and look, there's water. Humans get hungry, and oh, look, there's food. And so if you find yourself with a desire and a longing for joy that nothing on earth can satisfy, well, maybe you were built for something bigger than earth. Maybe you were built for something bigger than your life. And you see until you find what the bigger is, and you actually put your hope in heaven and your hope in Jesus Christ and your hope in the gospel, you'll never be able to fill that hole in your heart, and you'll never really know the joy and the hope of the risen Savior and how that is the key to a full life. You know, the opposite of joy is not sadness. Kind of like we say, a little opposite of love is, is hate. That's not true either. Opposite of love is apathy, it's indifference. The opposite of joy is not sadness. The reason we know that is because the Bible is constantly showing us that your joy is so great that it can coexist with your sadness. Jesus made that point in the middle of this John 16. He talks about it. He says this little thing about a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that is a child that is born into the world. Now, admittedly, I have not experienced giving birth to a baby. Um, I've never experienced that. Uh, I have experienced having to sleep in that chair next to the hospital bed overnight, which is pretty rough, but Tamara says not to bring that up when she's talking about <laughs> the other things. Whatever. But I will say this. I've had the wonderful, wonderful honor of getting to be in the room to experience the birth of my three children. And it is an intense, powerful moment. But then that baby comes and there is an explosion of joy and happiness and celebration in that room. But out of the three times that we've done that, Tamara's never leaped out of bed. I think Jesus is absolutely right. Like, she kind of forgets about her pain, but her pain isn't gone. But the joy of holding this sweet baby, this wonderful, perfect, beautiful baby overwhelms the pain. doesn't mean her, po- her body wasn't aching. I know this because with Penny, we were at the Newport Hospital, which is down at Hogue. Um, and uh, we're watching, I'm watching the water with Penny, and I'm telling her, oh, they've got kayaks. Oh, isn't this, this is so, so beautiful. And after like a minute, Tamara's like, will you stop? I can't see any of that. <laughs> oh, and I'm holding the baby. It's like, I'm just going to give this back to you, and then everything's good. And then she's happy again, because again, that joy of holding her baby made everything better. It is joy that overwhelms it. Jesus doesn't say your pain and sorrow and the world goes away. So what I worry is that many Christians, myself included, make this mistake. They believe, yeah, we're sinners and we need forgiveness. We don't see ourselves as rebels against God who need to lay down their will and surrender. We're all kind of in the business of sin management. Got to get to where I'm not sinning anymore. I'm just not sinning anymore. Great, that's good. That's a noble goal. We need to get there. But are you surrendering your life to what God wants you to be doing? Not sinning is part of it. It's a good thing. But surrendering your life to what God is calling you to do, that's the other part of it. And I worry that sometimes people look at Christianity and they go, well, this is my quick fix. It's a medicine. It's a tendency where people come and say, well, if I just kind of give myself to God a little bit here, a little bit there, all of these pains and sorrows in my life will just... There's never anywhere in the Bible that's a promise like that. 
As a matter of fact, as we've been saying this whole morning, we're to imitate who? Jesus Christ. Do you remember what one of his names was? What they called him? The man of sorrows. But we're told in Hebrews 12 that for the sake of the joy that was set before him, he ran the race. What does that mean? What does that mean? For the sake of the joy that was set before him, he, had the, he ran the race. Well, he had a joy that overcame, that overwhelmed his suffering. He had a joy that helped him keep going. It overlapped with his suffering, and it overlapped with an intense suffering and sorrow. He wept. He cried. But I'm convinced that at no point did Jesus ever ever, ever lose his joy of why he was there or what he was doing and whom he was doing it for. I feel that when people become far from God, when they start to live their lives further and further from God, they harden themselves because that's what they have to do. That's the only way that you can deal with the trouble of this world. You become tough. You hear that phrase, well, life is going to toughen them up. You don't have this joy welling up inside of them, keeping them steady. You don't have the assurance of the salvation. You don't have this intimacy and this relationship with God. So what are they going to do with their problems of their lives? Well, again, the only possible answer is to make yourself tough. That's the truth. You kind of have to start saying, I'm not going to let it get to me. So your heart becomes hard. It happens all the time. And people believe I, that the hardening with the hopes of this happening, that they're going to experience less suffering because of this. I've protected myself. I'm hardened from this. Now I won't be hurt by it. It doesn't really work, does it? Psychologists say that that's not a healthy way to do it. You can't just stuff those feelings down. Just, mm, can't let those out. I love when science comes around to what God's been saying all along. When we become Christians, when we become disciples, we cross over into faith and God changes our hearts of stone, our hardened hearts into what? Hearts of flesh. And those things get hurt. They're going to feel pain. Oh, yeah. So here we have those that have a relationship with God and those that don't. They're living in the same world. Don't get it twisted. It's not like, oh, we're different places. I'm just insulated from God's protecting me from all these things and heartache and pain. No, that's not it at all. We have a joy that will overcome that. When Job had all these things going on, to, just all these things happening to him, he ripped his clothes, he poured ashes on his head, he hit the dirt, and he cried out, and the Bible says, and all of that he did not sin. I wonder if Christians would say the same thing if we saw someone ripping their shirt and putting ashes and crying out, or would we say, well, you know what? That person just doesn't have any faith. They've really lost it. But the Bible says, no, in all this, Job did not sin, which means deep sorrow and deep pain is not incompatible with joy. They overlap it. Our joy is a deep and permanent thing. It says no one will take away your joy. The mark of real joy is that it's not subject to circumstance. It's no longer subject to the circumstance. But then why is it missing in so many lives of Christians? Isn't that the question? Why is it missing? And I would say our call to action, the thing that holds us back from experiencing that joy, and here's your push, your challenge, um, is us not obeying Jesus Christ. Um, and I think that what brings us joy is this clear conscience. I think if people bring honest and self, a big reason why a lot of Christians don't have this joy is they don't have a clear conscience. That's just kind of the truth because one of the foundations of joy is a clear conscience. It's one of the reasons why Christians can be bolder and happier than anyone else on earth. Our sins are forgiven. If you can look, or look at yourself and say, you know what, I'm completely forgiven and I am accepted that God has created me, that this God of all gods, the king of all kings, has wonderfully and beautifully made me and accepted me as a child of God and wiped my sins away. Oh, there's a lot of joy in that. A lot of confidence, a lot of boldness, by the way. 
Why does obedience of Christ bring about joy and why is Jesus constantly talking about it? If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. This isn't just me trying to guilt you or shame you or make you feel bad. Jesus Christ said this himself. If you don't feel it, it's not David making you feel guilty right now. That's not what's happening here. Jesus said, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. And then what does he say? I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Seems to me that when we obey him, it gives the spirit of God's scriptural freedom to operate in our lives in the most powerful ways beyond what we ever thought possible. And that's the fruit of the spirit. Through obedience comes joy. Joy is not the opposite of sorrow and pain and suffering. It's the ability to stay afloat on top of that. That's why Paul says, even though I have all these problems, they are slight momentary afflictions. That's what he calls them. But they are outweighed by an eternal glory beyond all comparison. And the ironic thing is that his, Paul's slight afflictions, his problems, being flogged, shipwrecked, starved, stoned, We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that the suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, and hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You guys ever wonder why hope isn't one of the fruits of the Spirit? You guys ever considered that? Why isn't hope in that list? Because our joy is in the hope. That's why. That's why. The joy of God's people is not determined by their needs or by their struggle, but rather by their future. If you're sitting here today and you don't have that hope yet, you haven't made that decision yet to obey Christ, to live in his love and live in the Father's love, we would love nothing more than to help you along in that path. Furthermore, if you're not feeling that joy in your life, if you're struggling with any of those things, that's okay. Sometimes it's hard to stay afloat. It's hard when our joy doesn't feel like it's keeping us afloat above that sorrow. That's why we here at the Canyon Church are trying to imitate Jesus Christ. And just like when Peter was sinking, we want to pick you back up. If there's anything we can do for you here today, let it be known. Please come as we stand and sing.